the, the perception, as you mentioned, is a little bit different maybe to, to people in the West of, of what Pakistan is like. But, but you, when, you, when you were younger, there were a lot of tourists and, and hiking and, and things yeah, like that. Happened. I remember... I remember in the you know, in the trains, the, the people would go and you'd see these guys, uh, girls, men, women. They came there for the best weed, and uh, for you know the the pot or marijuana or hashish. And they'd be. I, I've seen people just roaming around the streets. The kind of quasi hippies or leftovers of the hippie era. And I'm talking uh, late 70s, even even in the 80s, you could see that. And um, now uh, it's changed a lot, but uh, it's, there was no violence. There was no issue. It was the most hospitable place in the whole world. Went there, and people came. Tourist tourism was there, and um, exciting things happened. So, so maybe you can tell us because I was reading in uh, the sort of excerpt of the book that you uh, gave us to read. You you spoke a bit about the changes that happened, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about those changes. Um, you know, they're quite radical. Yeah. And, you know, they can be summarized uh, to a very particular event when, uh, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan um, in late seventies. And I, I was young, too young to actually remember that, but uh, that had happened and it was 78 or something like that. And uh, Iran had uh, the Khomeini revolution in, I think, 79. And the Iranian government, uh, the Shah of Iran had toppled. So that, if you think about it, Pakistan on one side has Iran. And uh, another side, it has um, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Then it has a bit of uh, China. Mm -hmm. And then it has India. And uh, Uzbekistan and the Tajikistan, the Russian republics, uh, at that time, the Soviet empire, that, they are also right there. So it's strategically, wow. it's, it's surrounded by these um, countries. So when the Russians invaded, there was this big, the first war, the first uh, Afghan war was fought. And the Americans were trying to push back the communists from uh, that time, from Afghanistan. And that's when the Mujahideen and all those people were fighting. And um, I remember that until that time, we didn't see any violence. But then suddenly when the huge refugee influx happened into Pakistan, perhaps one of the world's largest refugee people left Afghanistan and came into Pakistan and they were kept in tents. Millions of people came. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. was involved in, in Rambo 2 is a movie that actually kind of is set in that time. Rambo 3, I think, where he goes to... The, to save somebody, some soldier or whatever. So this is that era when the, so uh, that was a big change. And it was, a, it, it almost seems that those events happened completely randomly. That Russia invades Afghanistan, um, people get pushed out. America decides that we need to push Russia back and we need to arm the Afghans to fight against the Russians. Mm. And the Mujahideens come together. The Mujahideens end up, their children are born in Pakistan, and those children are called the Taliban. Mm -hmm. So who, who wow. could have crafted this story? No Jeez. way. Uh, this Talib means student. And mm -hmm. uh, so they lived in tents and camps provided by foreign aid. And uh, because there was nowhere to go and these amazing cricketers that you see from Afghanistan, if you go back to their, they literally learned cricket on the streets of Pakistan. Goodness. Why is it that uh, uh, the largest uh, fund in the world, uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink writes a letter to shareholders that make sure that you invest in those companies which are actually trying to do something, improve the lives of people. Today, yesterday, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, said exactly the same thing. Mm. And it is very, because there is no time left, we have finally come to that point in our world's journey that if we don't do something about it, this automation-driven um, success that will create relentless profit without using more people, more expenditure. Now these companies can grow even bigger. 
because they are so automated, so good, so efficient that that uh, it is it is almost counterproductive for them if they don't do something to improve the flock. Like for instance, Amazon has half a million people, and uh, half of them make less than $35,000 a year or $15 an hour. And they raised it from something to $15 an hour. Mm. Now, how can it be that half their workforce is slightly above poverty? Mm. This is not capitalism. It is tomfoolery. Mm. You are hurting yourself. You're, it's like a tree cutting its own roots. This creates a virtuous circle, which will, and there's so much data and, you know, conscious capitalism has produced it and every analysis now studies, research studies that those companies which are socially responsible and do the right thing are more profitable, long-term sustainable. Mm -hmm. The, The whole food story, which was acquired by Amazon is amazing. The Patagonia story. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the success of the guy who did Chobani yogurt, mm-hmm. the fastest to grow to a billion dollars in like five years, this guy in America made this Greek yogurt and multi-billion dollar company. And uh, what did he do? He treats his employees as owners. He gave everyone, uh, I mean, this is a whole new paradigm, but it is the oldest paradigm. Yeah. Do not hurt people. Mm-hmm. Do not mm-hmm. be aware of the unintended consequences. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I, I it's used, not rocket yeah, science, hey? Yeah, exactly. I used to I used to be an investment banker and you know, each quarter you would sit and you'd listen to the COOs and whatever give you this amazing talk in the auditorium and blah blah. And they and every single time at this particular bank the the guy that was at the the, the the helm, he would say the most important thing about this business is our customers. And every time I would sit there and I'd go, bud, you've got it so wrong. The most important thing about this is your employees. Yep. And yeah, you know, it's so great that there's people like you that are, doing this and the guy Chobani that are, that are changing that mindset and understanding who the important people are, because that needs to change. Businesses need to, need to really. I mean, it's, it's necessary. It is necessary. Uh, you know, the, 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 it is necessary now. Uh, it, if we don't do that, uh, we won't be able to, I think there'll be so much, so many people will be left behind that we will have to figure out what to do with those people. Because the fear is, and this is the sort of doomsday fear, but it could happen, that the people that will be left behind will be so far, their brains will evolve differently for the next hundred years. Because they will be so, uh, their children will go to different schools. Their anger will lead to all kinds. So there will be first time there will be a bifurcation in society. And it would be irreversible. Mm. Because if we don't do something about this inequality and things like that, we have to be sensitive to these things. You can't keep a you know, few hundred million people of the world left behind. It's dangerous. It's bad strategy. 